Hi, everybody. I'm Paul Yeager. This is the MTOM Show podcast, a production of Iowa PBS and the Market to Market TV show. We're back in the podcast studio this week, but we're talking about in the field when something happens and there's a need, specifically a farmer going through cancer treatment, a farmer injured in an accident, unable to get the crop out. Maybe it's uh, a family that's gone through another tragedy and could use some help. And that is what Farm Rescue is here to do. We're going to talk with Ben Smith from Farm Rescue today to kind of give you a background about this operation. Um, it is in a lot of upper Midwest states, according uh, to their their annual report here. We kind of not necessarily go through the report, but we give you the nuts and bolts of what how an operation happens where there is a case and a need and how quickly some help can be on the way when you need it most. Maybe you've heard of the organization, maybe maybe you've used it, or maybe you've just made a financial contribution and they could use your help. We'll let Ben tell us about ways that we can assist in this operation. Maybe it is your time, maybe it is your financial contribution, but just know what the organization is. That is our topic today. If you have any feedback for me on the show in general, just want to drop me a line. It's paul.yeager at iowapbs.org. New episodes of this podcast come out each and every Tuesday. Like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And now, let's talk farm rescue. I still get recognized for my time in the Quad Cities. And it's it always kind of throws me off. It's like, that was almost 20 years ago already. But what is it with television uh, and Channel 6 in the Quad Cities? What is it that still rings true with everybody? Right. Yeah, Paul, it's 20 years has flown by. You've aged well, I must say. But I do remember in, being introduced to you uh, when I lived in Muscatine and, and watched Channel 6 on news every night and, and saw you on there as an anchor occasionally and doing stories. And and I was kind of surprised to see you come to market to market eventually. <laughs> so it's wonderful to see you every week there now. I did another interview earlier today with uh, the son-in-law of a farmer I had interviewed in Rock Island County over the years. And so it is kind of funny how all roads lead back to the Quad Cities, at least in my world. So are you from that area? I grew up in Columbus Junction, uh, about uh, 45 minutes south of the Quad Cities and and about a half hour south of Muscatine. And the family farm is still back there in Louisa County. Uh, but uh, went to Iowa State and studied ag business and agronomy back in my college days and, and now currently reside in central Iowa in Gilbert, Iowa, just north of Ames. In those early days, uh, before you went to college, what was what was your dream? What were you thinking would be your path? Sure. Well, farming got into my blood at an early age like it does to a lot of farm boys. And, uh, and so I couldn't see myself doing anything besides... Uh, row crop farming some fashion. Uh, of course, had the dream to maybe take over the, the family farm. Uh, it didn't grow quite large enough to, to have room for both me and my dad and my uncle and grandfather and, and all the family members. So my uh, uncle's oldest son still runs a family farm back home. And uh, I went off to, to Iowa State to, to find my own path in agriculture somehow. And I've learned enough over the years uh, through different jobs and different farms I've worked on to where now I can serve as a field operations manager for farm rescue and uh, share my farming knowledge to help families during a time of need. And there is a need, unfortunately. I I guess I'll go back to my local TV days. Um, The first time I think I did a story that involved something similar to farm rescue was when I was in Mason City. I know I did one in Davenport. You think of first, it's when a, a group come together uh, you know, 12 farmers give this Tuesday, everybody's going to come and, and take out Farmer Johnson's its crop. Farm Rescue is way more than that. What What is the genesis of the organization? Sure. So that, that premise of neighbors helping other farm neighbors is definitely what we were founded on. We just wanted to have a, a full-time professional organization dedicated to do that if the neighbors maybe couldn't handle it all. Maybe the weather is really bad that season and it's just too short of a window for the neighbors to be able to do it themselves. Um, So we wanted to have this available to be able to step in and and provide machinery and labor to do some of the work, if not all of it, for the family uh, to get them through that season of crisis. So, um, yeah, it's very much founded on that. And sometimes we end up working with local neighbors to do some, and they do their part. And at the end of the day, it takes the burden off the family and some stress off the neighbors Mm -hmm. and gets it done in a professional and, and agronomically sound fashion. You will have, crisis happens, it doesn't just happen in July. It could happen in March, before the crop even goes in. 
And, right. and that is, I would imagine, all part of the process that you help work through. Yeah, so logistics obviously are a huge thing that, that we deal with, uh, trying to do this across the eight states we currently operate in. And uh, unfortunately, you never know when crisis is going to strike. It's not, a lot of times it's right in the middle of the season. Uh, maybe the farmer gets kicked by a cow while he's choring that morning. All of a sudden, he's got a broken leg in the middle of planting season. How is he going to cr- plant his crop now? Um, and so sometimes we're very much responding like uh, firefighters racing to the call. And then sometimes if a, somebody's getting ready to start cancer treatments, they know this a few months in advance, they'll reach out to us in the off season like this, and we can plan uh, well in advance and uh, not be quite so rushed. But we're used to responding in either fashion, and we can make it work and make, a, make it happen either way. But the more advanced notice we have, sometimes the less stressful it is for everybody involved. This is a North Dakota-based operation, is that right? Correct. So Farm Rescue was founded in North Dakota in 2005 uh, by uh, another uh, farm boy that grew up in the 80s and 90s on the family farm. Um, He did not have the opportunity to keep the family farm going either, so uh, he went off and and found his own way and actually became a professional pilot. Uh, His name is Bill Gross, and uh, he became a pilot and eventually now still flies uh, freight all around the world for UPS. Uh, flying 747s, doing that. But, of course, he always had farming in his blood as well. And uh, on one overseas flight he, several years ago, he was talking to his co-pilot about what he wanted to do in retirement, and he mentioned that he wanted to go get a tractor and cedar and, and plant for farmers when they couldn't seed the crop themselves that spring for whatever reason. And the, the co-pilot challenged him and said, you know, well, why wait till retirement? Why not try to start something like that now? And so Bill was still single at that time, and he used his vacation time uh, – to uh, get Farm Rescue started and, and go approach the first John Deere dealership and get some machinery. And then he found his first farmer to help that year and, and I think planted for two different farmers that first year. And then the next year, he found his first volunteer to run the machine so he could go focus on finding uh, other sponsors, other farmers to help and grow the, grow the organization and the mission. And that's how it all started. There are some of those organizations that start because of something very personal that happened to someone. There he had an idea. Do you know if the idea from what the Genesis was in 05 is very similar to what it is in 2024? Right. I have not got to ask Bill if there was any personal connection to why he had a passion for wanting to help help farmers. But uh, a lot of us that work for Farm Rescue do have that in our background. Uh, specifically, uh, my uncle was running our family farm and when I was in high school and in college, and uh, unfortunately he suffered a farm accident and died in 2003 at the beginning of harvest. And uh, I just graduated college and lived not too far away, so I was able to go stay with my grandparents that fall and uh, do all the farm work uh, and manure application that fall to help get them through that time. And so I, if Farm Rescue had existed then, I'm sure we would have talked and uh, been interested in looking at something like that. But I've I've kind of done my own little version mm-hmm. in the past, and uh, that's another thing that drew me to this organization and this job uh, was because I know how it feels to be in that situation, to be in that need suddenly, and uh, to wonder, what are you going to do? Because, you know, this is a family business. It's a legacy. There's a lot on the line. There's a lot of uh, dollars and debt sometimes that need paid back, and you want this to be done right, um, but not just any person off the street can come necessarily do your farm work for you suddenly. So it's great that we've got an outlet like this that uh, is so specialized, like Farm Rescue, so focused on this this effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can can do this for families when they need it. I think of the way uh, the farmer, when you pull into the driveway and, you know, they'll they'll help you. They might be outward about their assistance, Mm -hmm. uh, but usually most are pretty reserved about things. And they they might not... um, outwardly offer their assistance to someone else uh, in a big way. They might just show up someday. Is that, how do you get past that? No, I need some concrete help because we need to put together for this family that needs help at this exact time. How do you convince someone that it's, that it's important that uh, we get you to commit and Mm -hmm. uh, really follow through on this one to make sure it sees it to the end? Yeah. So uh, the volunteers that we have uh, doing the work and running the machinery for us, uh, They know up front exactly what Farm Rescue is about and what it requires. Luckily, a lot of them are retired, either retired farmers or retired from uh, careers at John Deere or other ag-related businesses. They've got this experience. Uh, A lot of them grew up on family farms themselves. That's why they're passionate about it. 
And uh, this is a great way that now that they have some time that they can give back and use their skills to help uh, a family in crisis. And they get to run some newer mm-hmm. uh, late model machinery, which is fun as well at the time, same time. So it's part of the logistical process as we are, are uh, setting up these crews in the off season, uh, preseason before it starts. And so we know we've got a spreadsheet that we've got everyone's name on that said they're available. And uh, we block out any dates they say they're not available. And if we happen to get a case during the time that they're available, we call them and let them know that it, there's a case. Are they still, can they still do it? And if not, sometimes that happens, something comes up, uh, we go down the list and call the next person. So it's a very big part of my job is putting the crews together, make sure we have the right set of skills for the job at hand. And it's always nice if they don't have to travel very far to, to do it too. And then, um, and then we keep that crew on that case the whole time generally until it's done, unless the weather or something interrupts the process and somebody has to go home. We'll weather. Does there. weather play into farming? Gosh, when's oh, that, yeah. when did that start? Yeah, yeah, that never affects anything. But uh, that is a huge thing that we deal with. Uh, you know, some volunteers uh, help organizations where they, they know two or three months in advance where and when they're going to be going. With farm rescue, unfortunately, we don't quite have that luxury. All of our work is based around the weather conditions in the field, and we may know not know uh, until two days before we need them there because things suddenly change, and now it's going to be fit, and uh, it's going to be ready to go. So we try to find volunteers that uh, are used to that kind of farming schedule and don't mind that so much and can get there on short notice and, uh, and work with us that way because Mother Nature is definitely in charge uh, at the end of the day. It sounds like a very large logistical challenge. I mean, spreadsheets help, but when you have somebody in, in we'll say, uh, southeast uh, North Dakota, but the volunteer is, I mean, where, how far away could a volunteer be from someone? Yeah, so we actually have registered volunteers from 49 of the 50 United States. I think Delaware might be the only state we're missing. So if you have any viewers or listeners from Delaware uh, that want to sign up for Farm Rescue, please go to our website. But, yes, so... Um, the volunteers live further away. A lot of them do fly in to the nearest airport and we try to get them there a few days ahead of time. And, and if it's not, the field's not ready when they get there, we find some projects, maintenance projects or machinery moving around, different things they can do until their case is ready. Uh, so they can plan a little bit ahead. But, uh, the other guys that drive in, um, again, they may just have a a day or two notice and, uh, they drive in and, and once they get on site, we provided the crew with a farm rescue pickup. It's got the tools they need to support the machinery they're working with, and we provide, a, you know, a stipend for meals every day, and of course their hotel costs, and take care of them while they're here serving. Uh, but they are required to uh, pay for their travel to the site. It's their contribution, yeah, um, into the way. Now I, I looked at you have ways that people can assist, to donate, to volunteer. I mean, you have different aspects. If not everybody is up to running machinery. There's other ways you can take advantage of their services. Yes, of course. So if you're passionate about helping fa- farm families during a time of need, uh, there's definitely ways we can we can find ways to, to utilize that. Not everyone is cut out to run the latest large uh, machinery. It gets very technical sometimes. Uh, it's uh, obviously very expensive and can be kind of stressful for some, and that's fine. Um, we don't. We want this to be a good experience for the volunteers, the families we're helping, and everyone associated with the case. So, yes, if if your passion is talking to others and spreading a message, uh, we always need people to help spread our message, either through social media or face to face farm shows or other opportunities, and that helps find new cases and families to help. That helps us find new volunteers. That of course all leads into helping us find new sponsors and fundraising because. As a nonprofit, this is all funded through donations from corporations, small businesses, and and individuals that want to see this service available when local farmers need it. It's almost like I hit a ding to say that this is the time to promote. Uh, February 8th, so this will come out after the Giving Hearts Day. That's a specific give day. And just because we miss that day doesn't mean that there isn't a way I can financially help. Right. So I'm glad you brought up Giving Hearts Day. That is a local uh, fundraising day based in the Fargo, North Dakota area, but it's spread into to other states now as well. But since Farm Rescue's main office is in Horace, North Dakota, just south of Fargo, we've been a part of this Giving Hearts Day fundraiser for several years now. And it's really wonderful because um, it just helps connect people who, who want to give to a charity during this season with several options to do so. 
but there's matching funds available for all these charities during this event. So any dollars they donate to Farm Rescue through the Giving Hearts Day fundraising website will be matched up to $100,000 uh, a donation. So that's a huge opportunity for us to really uh, make these donations go farther, uh, let them help more families in 2024. And so now they can start giving early. So the, the, the giving window started, you know, the second half of January, I believe. The actual Giving Hearts Day is February 8th. But even if they miss the deadline on the 8th, they can still give throughout the end of February until everything gets wrapped up and uh, get their donation doubled. If you have volunteers from 49 states and you have, I mean, what's the number of states then that you have oper or the ability to help and actually do, I don't know, if, is mission the right word or, or, or a job? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what We you, call them cases. Cases, yeah. okay. So how many states do you have cases in? Right. So again, Farm Rescue started in North Dakota in 2005, but we've uh, branched out into other states as we've gotten the resources to do so over the years. And uh, of course, Iowa is one of those now. And so we're in eight total states right now as we sit here uh, this day in 2024. And we will continue to look for opportunities to add more states as we have the resources to do so and our machinery and our volunteer skills are a good match for the farming that's done in those states. So I would think any any state where corn and soybeans and row crop farming is a, a big part of what they do, we would have the opportunity to maybe expand in to those states in the future. But we're in eight states right now, and I, would you like me to name them for you? Go for it. So obviously North Dakota is where we started. We have South Dakota, Minnesota, and Montana uh, will be our northern states. And then I'm the uh, field operations manager for what we call our Corn Belt states. And right now those would be Iowa, Illinois, Nebraska, and Kansas. And those are, you, you said, the, if, if it's soybean and, and corn base, you, you've got a lot of people with lots of uh, skill sets that match up with what the, the need is on each case. Right. So those are kind of the, the main crops that we, that we help families with here in the Corn Belt. That's what our row crop planters are more adapted to planting. But of course, up in the Great Plains in our northern states, we have a large air seeding equipment that can plant anything from soybeans to canola to wheat to uh, sunflowers, lots of different crops up there that they grow. And we also have the corresponding ability to harvest all those same crops with our combines in the fall. And we also do some hay baling in the summer. And uh, cattle feeding is the one livestock that we can help with since it's mostly outdoors and machinery based. And we do some commodity and hay hauling for those cattle producers or even a grain, grain producer. Uh, we had one that his semi uh, was lost in a fire and he had a contract to fill that week. We were able to come in and actually haul his grain that week to help him in that case because uh, he lost his uh, machinery due to a natural disaster. So, And I'm guessing that's probably the quickest turn that you've done? That sounds like yeah. a pretty quick turn. Yeah. So, well, a lot of times uh, the, the crisis may happen in the middle of the farming season, in, in which case they may contact us. I will try to get on site to do the farm visit as soon as I can within a day or two. And uh, we may have machinery there in less than a week. In a lot of cases, we try to be receptive to the, the ideal uh, agronomic farming windows when we can. And we certainly, everyone is, is ready to go at a moment's notice to get there as quick as we can. And like anybody, you're, like you said, weather dependent. I mean, you're trying to beat a snowstorm or a rainstorm. Sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. Now, if there is a plant that happens on a crop, you mentioned planting wheat or something like that. That also allows you to, to set up when it's time to harvest. So there are, sometimes there are ways to plan a little further out, and it's not quite as a quick turn uh, yeah. for each case. That's a good question. So uh, with Farm Rescue, the, the farm family is, is eligible for, for one of our services at, uh, once every three years. So if we did plant for the family, typically that's all we will do for them, okay. that particular family until three years later. Sometimes there's a special circumstance where they can talk to us and uh, we might build on a case by case to do a little more later in the season. But uh, we do like to plan ahead when we can. So if somebody's gonna be starting cancer treatments or some other medical thing that they know a few months in advance, this is coming, um, talk to us right away. We can get it on our calendar. We can get it on our schedule. We can certainly start reaching out to put the volunteer crews together because we know where the farm's gonna be when they want the work done or the ideal window when they want it done. We can start planning ahead and it takes a lot of stress off of our staff as well as the volunteers and the family themselves because they know now months in advance that this is going to be covered for them. And if they don't happen to be there, if they're in the hospital at the time, we can work through them through over the phone. We've got experienced people there, uh, 
you know, as field operations managers that are managing what's going on, that we can communicate when they want, what they consider time to go and when we need to stop. And, uh, and our volunteers are the same way. So the more advanced notice we have, the better, but we do understand that these things happen in the heat of the battle and we're ready to respond either way. A crisis hap- can happen at any time. Unfortunately, yeah, yes. Unfortunately, uh, nobody plans is. for a crisis. Nobody plans, huh? I guess not. Yeah. Do you find that in just this short amount of time that uh, needs have changed of, of farmer individuals? Have there been evolutions that Farm Rescue has taken where, oh, we used to do this, but now we found it's better if we, we do this instead? Have there, have there been cases like that? Sure. Obviously, we have to evolve and adapt uh, as changes in farming and technology happen through the years. Um, there's been a lot of, since 2005 even, there's been a lot of uh, changes in machinery technology and things we work with. You know, uh, our, our latest, newest air seeder that we put into service last year has uh, section control on that now to shut off uh, different swaths of the machine to prevent overseeding and things, just like we've had on our row crop planters for a long time. Uh, you know, auto steer and the tractors and combines has been a big help. And, uh, yeah, you know, we, we try to respond and do the work uh, just as good as the farmer would have done it himself. Uh, when we can plan for that, that is our goal. And uh, sometimes that might even mean we send a crew just to run the farmer's equipment. If he's got a specific uh, row spacing mm-hmm. or something specialized on his operation that we don't have the machinery for or have access to it, um, if his machinery is in safe working order, uh, we can send a crew to, to run his machinery and get the job done a little faster sometimes too if ours isn't available or isn't the right fit. So we, we look at all options available to us to, to make this happen when we're needed. And then in that same time frame, uh, maybe not necessarily the process and the, the equipment, but what about the person and the need and the family's need? Have, have those changed over that time? Yeah, of course. Uh, a lot of farms have gotten bigger over the years, and, and uh, maybe they've gotten out of livestock production or become more, more focused on, on one or two crops. And I think that has certainly changed uh, what farm rescue is, has needed to provide over the years. Um, you know, it started out as just planting only. The first the first several years, it was it was an air seeder and a tractor, and whatever we could plant with that air seeder in North Dakota is what they focused on. And then as they found over the years, uh, you know, farmers had crisis during harvest and other times of the year, too, that they may need help with. Then we focused on trying to acquire, uh, you know, obviously combines and harvesting equipment, uh, hay baling equipment for those cattle farmers or or ranchers that just need hay made in the summer, and uh, you know a fleet of semis to help move those products around and move our equipment around when needed, and so that is all things that have changed with Farm Rescue since it started uh, to meet the needs of the growers, and we continue to be focused and looking for different things that they may need going forward, and we will consider that uh, as it comes about. And I know you haven't said this, and this is probably I'm going to stick out just a tiny little bit here, but you are a sense of, I won't say mental health help, but you are a sense of relief to this person emotionally uh, when, you're, when your crew arrives. I mean, that has to, I know that's not what you're trained to mm-hmm. do, but that's, I would imagine, a little bit of a byproduct of what happens. Yeah, of, of course. Uh, you know, it can be a very emotional experience. Uh, you know, farmers are very uh, independent people. They've always had to work and build their operation, usually themselves, uh, without much help from anyone else. And so it can be difficult to to reach out and accept the assistance sometimes at the beginning. But once they see us pull in the driveway, they, they see myself and other staff come in to meet with them to make the plan ahead of time. Uh, a lot of times there is a huge wave of relief that may come over them. And, and uh, when they see the machinery, the crew get to work and the machinery actually start moving in their fields. Uh, many of them are brought to tears because it's such an emotional thing to know that, yes, this work is going to get done. It's going to get done well. I don't have to worry about this now. I can see it with my own eyes that this is going to be okay and things are going to be better. And that's a big reason a lot of our volunteers uh, come and do this every year as well. They, they get to see the difference it's making for the family, uh, get the emotional involvement and uh, tears and thank yous and hugs mm-hmm. when we leave. And uh, it's really a powerful experience for, for everybody involved at the end of the day. We talk about February 8th, Giving Hearts Day. That's not your day. That's a, what you're a part of. But right. if you want to be a part, givingheartsday.org is a thing. Uh, financial, if you want to help. 
as we close, what are the biggest needs you have in 24? What is, okay, so say I'm not financially able to give or I'm uh, the equipment or time. What's another way I can help? You always need volunteers, but where do you need these volunteers? And maybe it right. is to be the operators. Yeah, so the best thing they can do is just go to our website, farmrescue.org. Uh, that's got all the information there. We do regular updates on cases we're doing throughout the year. We've got great videos that we've made of families we've helped, how the process worked, how it affected them and the volunteers that I encourage them to watch. And, uh, yeah, so... Um, obviously, fundraising is always something that can be helped with. They can give right through our website anytime during the day and, and night and during the year. Uh, sign up to be a volunteer. That registration process helps or starts through our website. And um, spreading the word of an awareness about farm rescue. So um, most places I stop, even in Iowa still today, 95% of the equipment dealers or co-ops I walk into have never heard of farm rescue. Is at the farm show here in Des Moines today. A lot of people that walk by had never heard of Farm Rescue. So the first step and the first easy thing to do is just tell tell people about Farm Rescue. Share share us on your social media. Follow us and share us there. Help spread the word that this organization exists when people need it. It's kind of like insurance. They hope they never need it, but mm -hmm. when they do, um, it's very, it can make a big impact for them and their community. And they just need to know that we exist, how to start the process, and how to refer a family in need. Ben, in your book, uh, one of the booklets here that you had given, there is a couple of uh, volunteer awards. What were some yeah. of those volunteers that, what they do to so, earn that recognition? So those Good Samaritan Awards are something that Farm Rescue started a while back. They wanted to recognize those those special long-term volunteers that maybe some of them have been doing this since uh, almost since it started, about 15 years now. Um, and so they've been doing it a long time. They give, they spend their money to travel to the cases to get there. And uh, some of them do it for two, four weeks plus during the year. And so they've given a lot of time and effort during the years to to help Farm Rescue and help the families that are in need. And we want to recognize them for those efforts and uh, tell their, their individual stories. Uh, everyone came to Farm Rescue in a different way, it seems like. They all have different backgrounds and different stories to tell. And so we like to lift up a couple of those every year and recognize them for their years of service, tell their story about how they came to Farm Rescue and why they feel it's important for them to do this and support this mission and uh, recognize them for their efforts. It takes a lot of volunteers to make this happen. Mm -hmm. You want to give me a number of how many you might have right yeah, now? Yeah, so I believe in our system we have over 500 currently in the system. Again, not all of those are machinery operators, but it may be uh, somebody who has signed up to help in another way. And, you know, if we have 100 cases in a season, we may use uh, two to four volunteers per case. So, you know, that's uh, a couple hundred people that we can use a year potentially. Uh, and not everyone's schedule works for a case every year. But uh, if you stay in contact with us and want to be part of the mission, we will do our best to, to find a case that works for your schedule and works for you and get you involved in some fashion. I, I think you had, uh, you've helped a thousand families so far since 05. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. So we celebrated our 1,000 family helped here this uh, summer in June of 2023. And, uh, We'd like to continue to grow that exponentially as we move forward with more machinery and more volunteer and more resources. Um, there's there's a growing need all the time as farmers age, of course, and uh, and so we want to be ready to, to try to meet that need the best we can. And the last thing we want is for a farm family's business to suffer or extra stress to be put on them because they suffered a crisis and they didn't know the farm rescue existed to help during that time. Um, we're fine if somebody says, no, thank you. Uh, we don't want the assistance right now, but at least they knew about it and nobody falls through the cracks mm -hmm. because they didn't know about Farm Rescue. So that's the first big step is to make sure Farm Rescue is known throughout all these rural states, that it is an option, it's free assistance, it's easy to apply for, and uh, it's going to be professionally done. And we're going to help what the neighbors are coming out to help with already. We're going to be able to take a few of those acres off their shoulders so that uh, the work gets done in the, the fastest most stress-free way possible. Website again is? Farmrescue.org. All right. Ben, I appreciate the time and the insight and just the spreading the word about Farm Rescue. Thank you. Yes, thanks for this opportunity, Paul, and I uh, love your show. <laughs> again, that website is farmrescue.org. My thanks to Ben. My thanks to you for making it this long and uh, to see what's happening in the podcast. Remember, if you want to send something to be 
right over here off my shoulder. It's kind of fun to see and would be a great addition to our podcast table. Send it to iowapbs slash mtom show. P.O. Box 6450, Johnston, Iowa 50131. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.